The Labellus of Blessed Jordan of Saxony, Part 3. The heretics often mocked him, spat upon him, and threw mud, and such things at him. Later one of them repented and came to confession, where he told of striking St. Dominic with mud he had thrown, and of tying straws on his back to poke fun. Once he was asked why he did not prefer to stay in Toulouse, in the Diocese of Toulouse, rather than at Carcassonne and its diocese. Because in the Toulouse Diocese, he said, I find many persons who pay me honor, but in Carcassonne everyone attacks me. Once a general debate was scheduled to be held, against the heretics and the local bishop was preparing to go along in pomp with a splendid entourage. Not thus, said Blessed Dominic, not thus, Lord Father, should we go out against such persons. Heretics are more easily won over by examples of humility and virtue than the external displays or a hall of words. Should we not enter and rather arm ourselves with devout prayers, and, carrying before us the standard of true humility, proceed in our bare feet against Goliath? The bishop believed the man of God, and, sending back his equipage, proceeded barefoot. The place was a good many miles away, and, as they went along, they began to wonder whether they were on the right road. So they made inquiries of a man they thought was a Catholic, but was really a heretic. Sure, he said, I will not only show you the way, but I will lead you there myself. Then he spitefully led them out of their way, through a deep forest, over thorns and briars so their feet and legs were red with blood. But the man of God accepted it with the utmost patience, praising God and encouraging the others to praise God and have patience. Dear companions, trust in the Lord, for the victory shall be ours, because we have cleansed ourselves of sin with our blood. But the heretic, seeing their remarkable and joyful patience, was moved to sorrow by the words of the man of God. He confessed his deception and adjured his heresy. When they reached their destination, all their labors came to a successful issue. How he spent the night in prayer, wearing a wet habit which was found to be dry in the morning. It often happened that when they ran into rain on the road, and his and his companion's clothing would have become soaked through and through. After supper, while his companions remained before the fire and held their clothing over it to dry, as well as to recreate a bit, Blessed Dominic, the man of God, warmed by the fire of the Holy Spirit, would, according to his custom, go at once to pray in the church, where he would spend the entire night in prayer, no matter how wet his clothing. But in the morning, even though the clothing of the others that had been hanging near the fire would be still damp, his own were found to be as dry as though they had been in a warm oven all night. Concerning the coin miraculously provided as payment for a boat ride, one day, in the course of his preaching journey, he crossed a body of water in a boat with many other persons, but the mariner who had conveyed him insistently demanded a coin in payment for the passage. But the man of God promised him the kingdom of heaven for the service he had given, and then explained that, as a servant, a disciple of Christ, he carried no gold or silver with him. But he not only refused this promise, as though it were nothing, 
but seemed to have become more provoked by it and began to insist all the more sharply. As he tugged at Blessed Dominic's kappa, either you leave the kappa or pay me the fare. Then the man of God, raising his eyes to heaven and silently praying for a moment, turned his gaze towards the ground and saw there a coin which had undoubtedly been provided by God's favor. There, my brother, is what you request. Take it and let me go in peace. In the territory of Toulouse, where he often traveled in his preaching, Blessed Dominic one day had occasion to ford a stream called Ariagi. Halfway across, the books under his arm fell into the water as he lifted his habit, but he went on, praising God, until he left the home of a certain lady to whom he announced the loss of his books. Three days later a fisherman casting a hook in the waters thought he had caught a fit, fish, only to discover books at the end of his line. They were all well preserved, as if they had been carefully kept in a closed cabinet. More remarkable was the fact that the books were not only covered with cloth or leather, leather or protection of any kind. The lady accepted them joyfully and sent them to Toulouse to the Blessed Father. How he offered to sell himself to help someone. He was not lacking in that charity greater than which no man hath that he lay down his life for his friends. Once he was exhorting an unbeliever to return to the bosom of Mother Church, and the latter pleaded that temporal necessity bound him to the heretics, who gave him all he needed for a living, because he could not get them in any other way. Deeply moved by compassion for this man, Dominic resolved to sell himself and use the money to relieve his poverty of the soul. And he would have done so had not the Lord, who is rich towards all, provided another means of supplying that man's needs. He is known to have done something like that while he was still living in his own country. For a woman came to him weeping that her brother was being held captive by the Saracens. But filled with a spirit of charity, he was moved to compassion and offered to sell himself as a ransom for the prisoner. But our Lord did not allow it. <coughs> the servant of God, Dominic, grew in virtue and reputation to such a degree that he aroused the envy of the heretics. The kinder he was, the more difficult it became for their weak eyes to withstand the rays of his light. So they mocked and laughed at those who followed him, thereby bringing forth evil from the evil treasures of their hearts. But, although the unbelievers ridiculed him, he was consoled by the devotion of the faithful and was held in such loving veneration by all the Catholics that his delightful holiness and beautiful character stirred even the hearts of the nobles, and he was held in honor by the archbishops, bishops, and other prelates of that region. At this time the servant of God, recognizing full well that the hearts of sinners are moved by example more by th than by words, and that the vast majority had been led into error by the wily superstitions of the heretics, resolved to match example with example, and to attack pretended virtue with genuine. They were in the district of Toulouse, certain noble personages whose friendship had been won by the heretics, who were ravening wolves in sheep's clothing, for they assumed as usual, a remarkable air of humility in the clothing they wore and the pleasantness of speech, together with an unusual austerity in regard to food. They did, indeed, disfigure their faces in order to appear unto men to fast. 
would not even the wise be deceived at first by such appearances? Who would not regard them as very holy? No wonder that this holy model of zeal for souls wept at the very thought of these simple minds being seduced by such pretense. Accordingly, he visited some of the noble women and servants among the unbelievers, and received hospitality from them, and remained there through the season of Lent. Then, in order to win them by the outward signs of holiness, he and his companions began to practice such austerities as human weakness could never endure without the help of God's sustaining grace. For when they offered food prepared in the customary manner of his host, he said, We do not partake of such food during this season, just bread and cold water. This holy man and his compassions fasted on bread and water every day for the entire season of Lent until Easter, so that the servants of the heretics marveled and said, These men are certainly good men. When a bed suitable for resting was prepared for him, he would say, Not this soft bed, we shall rest on a table. And then each one reclined on a bare table. They used these tables as their mattress and furnishings every night of the Lenten season. Thus did they crucify their flesh daily, sleeping on a hard wood after the example of him who entered the sleep of death on the wood of the cross. Their sleep was brief, for they arose early to anticipate the vigils and to pray. Blessed Dominic himself asked some of the ladies to find him and his companions items of clothing which were, indeed, shabby, but very helpful. When they asked what kind of clothing they meant, they answered, hair shirts. But, he added, keep it a secret and don't let anyone know. They were deeply moved with admiration at such eminent holiness, and began little by little to be drawn to the faith of the Catholic truth. How he foresaw the death of the King of Aragon. Once the man of God spent the entire season of lead in Carcassonne in the house of the bishop, he busied himself with preaching and fulfilling some of the bishop's spiritual functions entrusted to him by the latter, who was then in France. Those were the days of increasing hostilities in the war in which the Lord Count Simon de Montfort was waging on behalf of the church against the Count of Toulouse. As the advantage began to swing against the church and in favor of the Count of Toulouse, a certain Cistercian lay brother, who was living there, began to lament this turn of events, and came in his grief to the servant of God, Dominic. Master Dominic, he said, will there never be an end to these evils? But when the servant of God gave no reply, the brother continued to question him, knowing that the Lord would reveal many things to him. Then, in the presence of Brother Stephen of Metz, who was his companion at the time, and whose frequent telling of this story is made it well known, he declared, There will certainly be an end to the wickedness of those from Toulouse. There will be an end but this end is far off. Meanwhile, many will shed their blood, and one of the kings taking part in the war will be struck down and die. Now, fearing that they might take it to mean the king of France, who had just adopted the Albigensian cause, he added, Don't fear for the king of France. It will be another king whose life the fortunes of this war will soon take. The following year, helping the side of Count Toulouse, the King of Aragon fell in battle. Would that he had never struggled against the church and died so unhappily. How he 
how he fasted an entire Lent on bread and water. The same friar, Stephen, added that throughout the entire Lent the servant of God, Dominic, ate and drank nothing but bread and water and never slept in a bed. But on Easter Sunday he said that he felt much stronger and he did seem to be healthier and not so lean. Then it was that the Count de Montfort, who cherished him with special devotion, gave a remarkable fortress called Casa Nuil to Dominic and the followers who helped him in the work of salvation he had undertaken. In addition to this, Brother Dominic had the church at Fanjou and other places from which he could derive enough to sustain himself and his followers. Whatever they could afford from these revenues, they gave to the sisters of the monastery of Pruil, since the order of preachers had not yet been instituted, only the plans of its institution had been laid, although Dominic himself persisted in the work of preaching. Furthermore, they were not yet following what would later be part of their constitutions, namely, not to accept professions, or keep those already accepted. Thus, from the time of the Bishop of Ozma's death until the Lateran Council, almost ten years went by, during which he was practically alone in this work. He started to think about founding an order whose duty it would be to travel throughout the world preaching the gospel by word and example and defending the Catholic faith against the heretics, then rearing itself. The First Brethren Offering Themselves to Brother Dominic At the very time when the bishops began to arrive in Rome for the Lateran Council, two good and worthy men of Toulouse offered themselves to Brother Dominic. One was Brother Peter of Sela, latter the prior of Lemongus. The other was Brother Thomas, a very gracious and eloquent man. The former of these, Brother Peter, gave Brother Dominic and his companions the tall stone houses he owned, near the village of Narbonne. And so, for the first time, they began to live together at the Toulouse in the same houses. From then on, all who were gathered there began to grow more and more in humility and live according to the customs of the religious. Our Holy Father was also in Israel, seeing God through contemplation. This is evident from the only example which has escaped from the hands of the harvesters. Our blessed Dominic frequently and willingly visited places of prayer, as well as the bodies of the saints. He did not pass through them like a rainless cloud, but frequently joined day with night in his prayers therein. More frequently, however, as often as the opportunity offered itself, he went to a town called Castrus in the Diocese of Albi, which is adjacent to the Diocese of Toulouse, to venerate and honor the blessed Levite Vincent, whose body is undoubtedly and certainly known from the time of the glorious King Charlemagne to repose in the church. For this church, the aforementioned noble Count de Montfort instituted during his reign, secular stipends in keeping with the practice of the Gallican Church. Brother Matthew, who later became the first and last abbot of the orders of the friars' preachers, was prior there. At the time of this prior, Blessed Dominic remained after Mass to pray before the altar in church as was his custom. 
how, as that day advanced, the meal was ready and the table set, the prior sent one of his clerics to call the saint to dinner, who, when he entered the church, saw the blessed man Dominic completely separated from the ground and raised into the air about half a cubit, about nine inches. Trembling and stupefied, he told this to his superior, who, after waiting a while, finally went and saw him raised about a cubit, about a foot and a half. He waited there, returning to his bodily dwelling from the heavenly habitation. He lay prostrate before the altar. Seeing this, the aforementioned prior, after a little while, followed him, who promised the bread of life and the water of heaven to all the persons he received. This was the Blessed Father's way of acting when he received the brethren and gave them the habit. The friar's preacher received possession of the aforementioned church with the body of St. Vincent and entered to dwell there in the year of Christ's grace. 1258, with strong support of Lord Philip de Montfort. The revenues from which they obtained food and other necessities. When the Bishop of Toulouse, Folks, of happy memory, who tenderly loved bro Brother Dominic, the delight of God and men, took note of the religious devotion of the brethren and of the, the grace and fervor in their preaching. So much did he rejoice at the coming of this fresh light that, with the consent of his chapter, he conferred upon them a sixth of all tithes of his diocese, and with this they were able to provide themselves with books and other necessities of life. The Vision of Seven Stars, which appeared to a master in theology. In Toulouse, one morning before daybreak, a certain master of theology, well born and renowned for his learning and reputation, was rehearsing his lectures. He became quite drowsy, and, resting his head on the desk for a time, he fell asleep. During this time, he seemed to see seven stars appear before him. While he was lost in admiration to the novelty of the scene, they increased in size and brilliant brilliance to such a degree that they lit up his own country and the entire world. Then at once he awoke, and, seeing that the day had begun, he called the servants who carried his books and set out for class. And behold, blessed Dominic and six companions clothed in his habit humbly approached this master and identified themselves as the friars who had been preaching God's gospel to the faithful and against the unbelievers in the Toulouse area. They told him that they had come to attend his classes and wanted very much to hear his lectures. The master agreed and for a long time regarded these seven friars as his devoted friends and instructed them as his students. But, recalling the vision he had seen earlier, he interpreted Blessed Dominic and his companions as the seven stars which he saw suddenly grow in brilliance by reason of the enormous light shed by their good name and their knowledge. Accordingly, he treated them with the greatest reverence, always held them in the greatest affection. The same master told this to Brother Arnolf of Bethunia and his companion when they were in the court of the King of England. How Master Dominic went to the Pope with the Bishop of Toulouse. This same bishop, took Brother Dominic as his companion to the council, and together they besought the Lord Pope Innocent 
to confirm Brother Dominic and his companions in an order which would be called and would be an order of preachers as well as to ratify the revenues already assigned to the brethren by the count and the bishop. After listening to this request, the head of the Roman See urged Brother Dominic to return to his brethren, and after a full discussion with them on the matter of unanimously accepting an already approved rule, the bishop would assign them a church. After that, he was to return and get the Pope's approval of their work. Accordingly, after the council, Dominic returned to Toulouse. Calling the brethren together, he notified them of the Pope's wishes. Now the future preachers chose the rule of St. Augustine, who had been an outstanding preacher and added to it some stricter details about foods and fasts, as well as about bedding and clothing. They agreed also to hold no possessions, lest concern about temporal things be an obstacle to their office of preaching, but would remain content with their revenue. Along with this, the Bishop of Toulouse, with the consent of his chapter, assigned them three churches, one within the city, another in the village of Parniers, and the third between Sorez and puy Lorenz, called the Church of St. Mary of Lescour. A convent and priory were attached to each of these churches. The first church conferred on the brethren at Toulouse. During the summer of 1612, the brethren received the first church of Toulouse, which had been built in honor of St. Romain. None of the brethren had ever lived in either of the two churches, but in the church of St. Romain they built an enclosure, above which were cells for study and sleep. At that time the brethren numbered about sixteen. How Dominic foretold the conversion of Brother Raymond, who had been a heretic. Once, when the servant of God, Dominic, was preaching in the Toulouse area, a number of heretics who had been arrested and convicted by him were turned over to a state tribunal after they refused to return to the Catholic faith. Since they were to be burned at the stake, he looked at them and looked at one named Raymond de Grassi as though he observed a ray of divine predestination in him. Release him, he said to the officials of the court, and don't bum him with the others. Don't. Then, going up to him, he said gently, I know, my son, I know that, although late, you will yet be a good holy man. Then a marvelous thing worthy of being recorded took place. He was released and, for almost twenty years, remained in the blindness of his heresy. But at last, illumined by grace, he left the darkness and came into the light. He became a friar and led a praiseworthy life in this order until his happy death. death of the Lord Innocent, and elevation of Pope Honorius, who confirmed the order. In the meantime, the Lord Pope Innocent died and was succeeded by Honorius, upon whom Dominic called at once in order to be present, present and present the plan and organization agreed upon by his order. From him he obtained full and complete confirmation of the order and of everything else he requested. The vision Dominic saw at Rome in the Basilica of the Apostles Peter and Paul. Once when the servant of God, Dominic, was at Rome at the Basilica of St. Peter, where he was praying fervently in God's sight for the preservation and growth of his order. 
which the right hand of God had raised up through him, he saw the glorious princes, Peter and Paul, coming toward him in a sudden vision wrought by the power of God. Peter, who was first, seemed to be handing him a staff, Paul a book. Then they spoke these words, Go and preach, because you have been chosen by God for his work. And then, in a moment of time, he seemed to see all his children dispersed through the world and going two by two, preaching the word of God to the people. When the order should have been confirmed by apostolic successor, he commanded the secretary to put down preaching friars in addressing the order. Writing the letter of confirmation, the secretary put down friars preachers. When he looked at the letter, the apostolic successor asked the secretary, Why have you not written preaching friars as I told you? Did you want to write preachers? In all calmness, the latter answered, Preaching is an adjective, although it may be granted that a participle can be used as a substantive and serve as a common noun denoting an act. But preachers is properly a substantive and is both a verbal and personal pronoun wherein the name of the function is most clearly stated. You see, then, reader, how truly the secretary answered the objections. For preaching never signifies its content other than by way of act, whereas preacher signifies its content after the manner of a habit, even though this content may not always be an act, and therefore it was fitting that preacher be put down. The apostolic Lord Pope, agreeing with this most patent argument, the order received the title of preachers and was solemnly confirmed by the cardinals. The Lateran Council having been celebrated in the year of our Lord 1215, the Pope, ordering certain agenda pertinent to the promotion of the faith in the Toulouse area, and deciding to write about these agenda to Blessed Dominic and those who were with him, told the secretary whom he had called, sit down and write about these matters to Brother Dominic and his companions in exactly these words. And after standing up a bit, he said, do not write it that way, but in this manner. Brother Dominic and those who are preaching with him in the area of Toulouse, etc. And immediately after taking more time for further consideration, he said, put it down this way. Master Dominic and the friar's preacher, etc. And he got up. This is how the Lord Pope said it, and this is how the secretary wrote it. <laughs> 